2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. Let's all stand to our feet for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Boy, suffering with this for a whole month is not fun. Uh, just, uh, <clears throat> just pray that I have, I, I need, I need like, I need God's strength <laughs> to get through this. <clears throat> um, not sleeping is, is not easy. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. Let's read verses 5 and 7 together, which are highlighted in green. I will read verse 6 alone, okay? Here we go. Verse 5, let's start together. Ready? Begin. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul. And have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you. And I also will requite you this kindness, because ye have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened, and be ye valiant, for your master Saul is dead. And also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we need you now, Lord. Please. Fill this entire room with your Holy Spirit's power and presence. And God, uh, speak through me now, Lord, during the most important part of the service, the preaching of your holy word. Lord, please speak through me and don't let a single word come out of my mouth that is outside of your will. And Lord, please give me the voice and the ability to preach your word effectively. Lord, use me for your glory and honor. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we are continuing our series on King David, Lessons from King David. <clears throat> and the last time we uh, looked at the story, King Saul and his sons were killed in battle, okay, in, in Gilboa. And they, uh, they went to battle with the Philistines. David was providentially protected from joining the Philistines in fighting against his own people. Uh, <clears throat> and so... The Philistines, Israelites fought, and the Philistines prevailed. Saul died. All his sons that were in battle died. <clears throat> and the Philistines took the body of Saul and his sons and uh, stripped, stripped them of their clothes to humiliate them, cut off their heads um, and, and their, their, their limbs, and, and basically displayed their bodies, what's left of it, uh, in a public display to, uh, you know, brag about their victory in the land of the Philistines. And it was very disgraceful, disrespectful, and, and cruel, uh, you know, and, and uh, to, the, to the nation of Israel to see their king and their princes be displayed that way uh, in the land of the Philistines. And, you know, desecrating the bodies of their kings their king and their, and their princes. <clears throat> and so these men from the city of Jabesh Gilead. Now, just to refresh your memory, Jabesh Gilead was a city that was threatened by a, a king of the Ammonites by the name of Nahash. King Nahash uh, surrounded the city of Jabesh Gilead and and uh, wanted a besiegent was wanting to go to war, set himself in array, wanting to go to war with Jabesh Gilead and conquer the city. And the men of Jabesh Gilead knew they had no chance. So they sent ambassadors out to King Nahash, uh, willing to be their servants. They said, you know, Nahash, just tell us what we must do and we'll surrender and we'll be your servants, you know, forever. Uh, because we just, we have no chance, there's no way we're going to win. And Nahash said, Sure. Sure, you can be my servants under one condition. You let me poke your right eyeballs, every single man in the whole city. I'll, I'll pry out your eyeballs, and then you can be my servants. And so they're like, whoa, that is messed up. That is cruel. And so they said, can you give us seven days to make a decision? And uh, he said, yeah, sure, I'll give that to you. And so the men of Jabesh Gilead reached out to King Saul and said, Saul, help us. This is what Nahash wants to do. That We can't win. We're going to lose either way. Even if we surrender, we lose. Like he's, he's a cruel man. And King Saul reached out to the land of Israel 
and said, we must defend our brothers in Jabesh Gilead. <clears throat> and a lot of the men were afraid. Oh, we're afraid of Nahash. We don't want him to poke our eyeballs out. And so what Saul did was Saul took a, uh, a yoke of oxen, chopped it up into little pieces and sent it out throughout the land of Israel and said, this is what I'm going to do to the man who refuses to fight. So now the men were more afraid of Saul than they were of Nahash. Oh, okay, 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 we'll fight. And so he rallied the troops together and, and, and acted like a king and defended the city of Jabesh Gilead. And because of that, and, and God brought him the victory against Nahash and the Ammonites. Because of that, the men of Jabesh Gilead were fiercely loyal to King Saul. And so when they found out that Saul had been killed and all his sons and their bodies were desecrated, valiant men from the city of Jabesh Gilead, who remember what Saul did to rescue their city, made the trek over into enemy territory, the Philistines, in the middle of the night, risked their lives to retrieve the body of Saul and, and those of his sons and, and, and take them down from public display and humiliation, brought them back uh, to their land and buried their bodies. These were brave, brave men. And now David has been made king over Judah. The men of Judah met him in Hebron and say, well, you know what? We're done with Saul. You are our king, David. So uh, now remember, God, through the prophet Samuel, anointed David to be king over all of Israel, like over 20 years ago. But, but for now, he's only the king of Judah. It's going to take some time. We'll look at that a little bit later. But David is now set to be the king. But Judah has already submitted themselves under his authority, under his king, kingship, and David now is approaching the men of Jabesh Gilead, and he, and he knows they're fiercely loyal to Saul. Remember that David also loved Saul, right? Even though Saul tried to kill him. And so David is speaking kind words to Jabesh Gilead, saying, what you did was right. What you did was, was brave, courageous. I commend you. Blessed be ye of the Lord, David said. He was blessing them and being kind because they just lost their favorite king, Saul, the king who'd rescued them, the king who they were loyal to. This was hard for the men of Jabesh Gilead. And so David was trying to encourage them and be kind to them. And we can certainly learn from this lesson because we know throughout history, we've seen other kings behave very, very differently. We've seen other kings, the moment they're in power, you better do what I say or I'm wiping out your city, threatening people, but not David. David said, you did right to, to, to retrieve the desecrated bodies of your king, of our king. Saul was my king too. David was kind and gentle with the men of Jabesh, uh, Jabesh Gilead. Number one, first lesson we can learn is be the kind of Christian who picks people up when they're down. <clears throat> be the kind of Christian who picks people up when they're down. David could have easily, and I think other men would have, turned against the men of Jabesh Gilead and say, ha, you should have backed me up. I would, don't you know that God picked me, not Saul? Don't you know that Saul was in the wrong and you were loyal to the wrong guy and now you get what you deserve? You lost your king. He's dead. I'm the king now. What are you going to do about it now? David could have done that, but he didn't. He was kind. He was gracious. He was merciful. The men of Jabesh Gilead, the people of Jabesh Gilead were in sorrow. They had just lost their king. A king who meant more to them, I think, than any other city. They just lost him. <clears throat> this was a big deal. They were down. And rather than kicking them while they were down, 
David reached out a hand and said, I know. He was my king too. He's our king. Blessed be ye of the Lord. What you did was awesome. Bless you for it. Now, let me encourage you in the Lord. And he extended a hand of fellowship. <clears throat> you know, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when the mask hysteria was happening during COVID and you couldn't even go into stores without having to put a piece of cloth across your face, the face diaper. I like that was what uh, I think Kathy called it. I love that, the face diaper. It's what it felt like, you know? <laughs> couldn't breathe. I'm like, you know, breathing in my own carbon dioxide and <clears throat> it was torture. And I am, I can be pretty outspoken sometimes. And I've gotten in conversations with store owners about this. I'm not store, store owners, employees. They're not the owners, like at Costco. Like, why are you, you know these masks don't work. Why are you making me wear this? And why are you making my kids wear this? This doesn't make any sense. And, uh, oh, this is standard policy, sir. <laughs> I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know, I just, I, I'm old enough to remember this. And they would even sometimes, in some of the stores, have the disposable ones in a box where you can, they'll provide it for you, you know? And I have pointed it out to them. I'm like, I want to show you something. Because on the box it says, does not protect against viruses. You can read like I can, right? It says it right here on the box of masks that you are handing out to people that is supposed to protect them against the virus. <clears throat> I remember the ridiculous arguments I've had to have with people getting yelled at for not wearing a mask. I've, I've been yelled at. Anybody here get yelled at for not wearing a mask? Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm not the only one. All right. I'm not the only ordinary person. All right. <laughs> yeah, getting yelled at. You, you want to kill grandma. No, I don't want to kill anybody's grandma. And then all of a sudden, just like that, Fauci and the CDC come out and admitted, well, the masks don't really work. And the whole mask hysteria died down, and now it's over. No more mask hysteria. I'm going to be honest with you. My flesh wants to go back to all of those people who gave me a hard time and do one of these. You remember me? Yeah. Yeah. You fool. What did you do? All the stupid things that you said. You, you, I mean, you, you made a fool out of yourself. My flesh wants to do that. But of course, the Spirit of God says, be better than that. And you know, there are times where people who maybe aren't the nicest people to you, who are down, and you have an opportunity to reach a hand to help. You know, I think that's the Christ-like thing to do. <clears throat> when we were down, when we were sinners, Christ didn't kick us. He died for us, right? He extended his hand of fellowship when we were at our worst, while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. David set such a powerful example I still have faces in my mind of people who yelled at me, accused me of being evil, of being irresponsible, grandma killer, you know, all of those things. Grandma Sherry, I don't want to kill you. That's ridiculous. I don't want to kill any, anybody's grandma. And these faces are still in my mind. You know, I'm not angry at them. I'm sure they know how foolish, hopefully, depending what they watch on TV, depending what news network they watch, but I'm sure that many of them by now are realizing how silly that whole thing was. There's no use kicking people while they're down. You know, the Christ-like attitude is to do exactly what David did. Find a way to make amends. 
and restore that relationship and strengthen that relationship and <clears throat> bless them in the Lord. You know, Saul of Tarsus was going around persecuting Christians when Stephen, the first deacon, was stoned to death. They laid their coats at the feet of this very same Saul of Tarsus. <clears throat> and then one day, Saul saw Jesus himself and said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And it was so powerful that it blinded him. And, and Saul literally could not see and had to be guided by the people that were with him. And a man by the name of Ananias came and prayed for him. And the scales fell off his eyes and he was able to see. But what if, what if Ananias said, but that's Saul. No, this is good. He's a persecutor of Christians. I don't trust him. No, you know what? God blinded him for a reason. Because of what he did, let him stay blind. Let him be blind. What if Ananias did that? Who would be there to mentor Timothy and Titus and Barnabas and Silas and John Mark? I remember reading a very powerful quote that said, uh, <clears throat> imagine, imagine after uh, Paul was beheaded that when he entered into heaven, He entered, or he was greeted and applauded by Christians who were martyred by him. Think about that. That's, that's powerful. Why? Because Ananias extended the hand of fellowship instead of kicking him while he was down. And that is the Christ-like thing. To do. Be the kind of Christian who picks people up when they're down. You know, if we have the love of God in us, it's even Jesus, when, when Judas approached him after he'd already betrayed him, what did Jesus call him? Friend. He said, Friend, betrayest thou me with a kiss? Friend, he called Judas friend, giving him one more chance to do the right thing. I know sometimes people can say or do really hurtful things. They really can. But that doesn't mean that we have the right to do it right back because it'll make us feel better. That when they're down, that somehow it's, it's God's opportunity to kick him in the face, you know, and, and, and get our revenge. No, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. God said that. It is not our place or our duty, especially as the New Testament church, to repay. <clears throat> Of course, you know about Nate Saint and the five, the four other missionaries in Ecuador who were all murdered by the Alca Indians and how their wives, instead of taking revenge, because the government was ready to mow them down with bullets, and their wives said, no, 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 no. We're going to continue our husband's ministries and moved in with these savage tribes because they knew they would be gentle with the women. And they were. And their children even grew up in these tribes. And one by one, the very people who murdered their husbands and the fathers of their children were one to Christ. Because of that extension of the hand of fellowship. Be the kind of Christian who picks people up when they're down. Next. <clears throat> But Abner, the son of Ner, 
captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, Mahanaim, and made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. So here we can see a split. The rest of Israel was not ready to follow David yet. Only the house of Judah at first. <clears throat> now, look at this last verse here. Verse 11. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. It took the rest of Israel seven and a half years to finally say, okay, David, be our king. Seven and a half. First of all, it had already been about 20 years since David was anointed by Samuel the prophet to be king over Israel. Already over 20 years. And now David would have to wait yet another seven and a half years to, to fulfill, fully fulfill the will of God. For his life. But you know what? David did not, did not allow that to hinder him from being a good king to Judah. He didn't, you know, he had, he had two options here. Well, first let's get to the point. Number two, be grateful for every little victory from God. Be grateful for every little victory from God. Yes, of course, he was supposed to be king over all of Israel. But he'd have to wait just a little longer. But, now, but for now, Judah, the whole tribe of Judah had surrendered themselves. In fact, very gladly made David their king. That, folks, that's a victory. That's a victory. And, you know, a lot of people, especially men of less character and, and men of like if this were King Saul that would not have been enough because King Saul as we know a very selfish man thankfully it's David but if this were King Saul or any, any lesser of a man he would have been too ambitious he said no way there's no way. I'm supposed to be king over everybody Ishbosheth. no we need to launch a war kill Ishbosheth, kill anybody who opposes, and we need to invade uh, the rest of Israel because I am the rightful king. David didn't do that. He did not do that. They did have a bit of a civil war. It was more skirmishes between Abner and Joab, but David largely kind of just backed off and said, it's okay. I'm king over Judah has, 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 has surrendered to me, so I'm just going to be their king for now. He had a choice to either whine and complain or be the best king that Judah could ever ask for. He chose to be the latter. And the men of Judah loved him, loved him as their king. <clears throat> be grateful for every little victory from God because you know what? This similar scenario happens a lot in our lives where we expect this and God only gives us this. And we think, but, 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 but. And we have a choice to make. We can complain and say, I want this. Or we can take this and say, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. And make the best out of this as we possibly can. What God has given us. You know, I, <clears throat> I realized in my, after getting married, I think, and after having kids, especially, kind of in hindsight, looking back in my life, so many foolish mistakes I made when I was younger, and I think a very common thing that a lot of people make a common mistake that people make is always always looking back and 
and wishing you could go back and appreciating and 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 um, almost coveting the past. You want to go back in time. Oh man, that was so great. Forgetting the fact that when you were going through the hard times during that time, you were complaining during that time. And then now that it's beyond us, you know, and I, and I try to remind my kids all the time, hey, stop complaining. Enjoy your childhood. It's going to be over just like that. Okay? Hey, you listen, I know, I know I give you a lot of rules, but enjoy them. Because someday you won't have to submit to my rules anymore. And you're on your own. Like you, the, the, the hard, cold world, it's just you against the world. And, and, and let me tell you, the consequences of your decisions will be much bigger than just being grounded or having electronics taken away or whatever, you know. <clears throat> Even the two years I spent at the boarding school after I left, I looked back, I thought, wow after having to pay for my own bills and, and struggling to, to pay my bills and make ends meet, you know, being a full-time college student, paying, you know, and, and, and doing all of these things and, and, and the ministry, you know, uh, I was also working in a ministry there that, that I was funding out of my own money, you know, and, and, and uh, it was tough. And I look back and, and having to maintain my car every time it broke down, I was like, ah, it's more money, okay. Look back and I thought, wow, you know, the boarding school was strict, but I had three square meals a day I didn't have to worry about. I got a solid nine hours of sleep every night. That was amazing. Sometimes more. I got to play all kinds of sports and games and, man, I miss those days. And you know what? I wasn't the only one. I talked to many former students uh, even after, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I had left the school and many former students said the same thing. Oh, man, that's crazy. I never thought I would ever say this, but I miss those days. Life is hard. You know, the time to enjoy life is right now. It's not yesterday. Yesterday's over. You know, oh, I wish I could go back. Why? Why do you want to go back? Had you forgotten the struggles that happened during that time as well? There's never been a time in, in anyone's life that there's no struggles. Your emotions will try to trick you and make you remember only the things that, that, that it wants you to remember, often in a deceptive way. No, every moment I realize now more than any other, other time in my life. And I can't, I can't preach this enough to people. Enjoy every moment with every person that you have right now. Right now. Every little victory that you have right now. It is not worth it to complain about the past or the future or anything because there is so much to be grateful for. So much. You know, David could have looked over here. I, I, I deserve this and I don't have it. And instead, he chose to look at this that he did have and say, wow, I have this. Listen, we don't deserve anything as sinners. We don't. Everything that God gives us is a gift of grace and mercy upon our lives. Our families, our friends, our church, our home, everything, every little thing we ought to be thankful for because every little thing is a victory in our life that is worth celebrating. Our friendship is a victory worth celebrating. The warm bed you get to sleep in tonight is a victory worth celebrating. What you have in your bank account, no matter how much or how little, is a victory worth celebrating. Our church, I mean, we're talking every little thing. We ought to thank God and celebrate the victory that he's given us. Be grateful for every little victory. 
course, that's a relative term. We may interpret it as little. Others may interpret it as big. You know, for us, like, oh, yeah, so what? I have a warm bed at night. <laughs> I'm telling you, there are people all over the world who, who, if they got a warm bed to sleep in tonight, that's a huge victory for them. Huge victory. Be grateful for every little victory from God. Next. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the so servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out. Oh, I already read this. Did I read this? Oh, no. Now, Mahanam to, to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, uh, and the servants of David, went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. Here's where the trouble starts. <clears throat> and they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, let them arise. And there arose and went over by, by number 12 of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul. Remember, Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. And 12 of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the beard and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together. There, wherefore, that place was called Helkath Hazer. Uh, Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. And there was a sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. So, wow, what a, what a violent event. Twelve and twelve stood up, met each other, and they just stabbed each other, and they all died. Twenty-four people in one fell swoop just died. Twenty-four men. And then from there, they started battling, skirmishing with each other. But Abner lost the battle. Abner was a mighty man of valor. He was a mighty warrior and a mighty general for Saul. But look at this, 1 Samuel 3, verse 1. Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. I want to point something out real quick. Okay, first of all, before I do that, let's, let's get to the point. Number three. Make sure you are always on God's side. So, wow, how do you get that point from that story? Because I want to look at the two men involved here in this story. You have Abner and you have Joab. For those of you who may not know the story of these two men, Abner, though he was misguided, was a good man. He was a man of integrity. Joab was not a good guy. Joab was David's like second cousin twice removed or something. He was related to David somehow, uh, like an uncle or something. And Dave, David, and he's also a very, very mighty warrior. He was, he was skillful with the sword. So David made Joab his captain. You know, it was his relative. And uh, D, uh, Joab was, uh, you know, I want to say Joab was fiercely loyal to David, but he actually wasn't either. He wasn't even that loyal. Uh, you know, we won't get into that yet. But, uh, but Joab was... He was sneaky. He was a murderer. Joab was not a good man. Okay? But Joab was leading the, the, the armies of David and the men of David. He was the, ca the, whole, the captain. David was the king. Joab was the captain. Ishbosheth on the other side was the king, and Abner was the captain. And so Abner and Joab were constantly skirmishing. And even though Abner was a better man than Joab, the house of Ishbosheth, or the house of Saul, was waxing weaker and weaker, and the house of David, David, was waxing stronger and stronger. Why? Because Joab may not have been a great guy, but he was siding with the right person, David. Joab chose the right side. He chose David. I remember. I I I I, I love reading history. First of all. And I remember reading about the Civil War, and I, I just, man, the Civil War, so many incredible details about the Civil War. <clears throat> but I remember reading uh, a, a quote from Abraham Lincoln. He was approached by one of his generals. Now, both sides claim to be Christians. The North and the South both claim to be believers, both claim to be Christians, 
Both claim to have God on their side. The South, you know, claims that they're fighting for states' rights, and 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 you know, the they call the Civil War the the War of Northern Aggression, uh, you know, and and they just um, you know reworded everything. The North, of course, is. Uh, worded it to, to, to be completely against slavery. The whole war is all about slavery. You know, we, we must abolish slavery. And one of the generals approached Abraham Lincoln and said, Mr. President, I sure do hope God is on our side. And Abraham Lincoln, though <coughs> not necessarily a Christian, I don't believe Abraham Lincoln was a Christian, okay? <coughs> he knew how to speak like one, but I'm not convinced that he was a saved man, okay? He had seances with his wife in the White House and all kinds of weird stuff going on there. But nevertheless, he did have high regard for the Bible and for, for the Lord. And when this general said, Mr. President, I sure do hope God is on our side because the war was just dragging on. President Lincoln turned to this man and said, I am not worried whether or not we are on God's side. My main concern is, is God on our side? Is God on our side? And let me tell you, those are powerful words. Because, you know, for us to think that, you know, God should be on our side because, you know, we have justified in our rationale and our mind that what we're doing is right. But have we taken the time to see if we are on God's side? And this is why I, I, exactly why I believe the North won the war. Simply because in Leviticus, it is absolutely wrong to steal a man against his will and enslave him. God wanted to uh, abolish this practice of human slavery. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you know whether or not Abraham Lincoln was a godly man or even a saved man it's not the point the point is what is God's side then we must choose that side and the war between uh, the civil war that was happening between David and Ishbosheth, clearly God was on David's side and even though both the wars and the skirmishes were run by Joab and Abner, Abner being the much better man, by the way, David himself even said that, Abner was a much better man than Joab was as far as integrity, character, everything. Abner was losing because Abner was on the wrong side. We as believers, both individually and as a church, corporately, must choose God's side in every case, in every instance. You know, I don't understand how, first of all, churches can allow the, some of the abominations that I see. I, I've see I, I, I just, I can't tell you how many videos I've seen of, of churches practicing just abominable things, allowing men dressed as women to come up here and blaspheme the name of God behind their pulpit and all kinds of nasty, disgusting stuff. <clears throat> and preaching heresies from behind the pulpit and, and turning the church from a family to a machine that is just cold and cold-hearted and only after money and treating their people like just a number. And then at the same time, I don't understand how some Christians can stay at these churches who have compromised the truth. I remember speaking with an elderly gentleman who has been going to this, this church decades, okay, decades now. And this church had voted in a woman pastor, which he knows is wrong, biblically is wrong. And, and he's complaining to, to us about it. Say, oh, they shouldn't have done that. You know, that's not biblical. I'm not a big fan of it. But did he leave the church? Nope. He's still there. 
Why? Why would you, would you knowingly stay at a place that you know is going against the word of God? Folks, we ought not to do that. Both, again, on an individual basis and, a corporate, and corporately as well. As a church, we must always be careful and be sure that we are on his side in all that we do. God's side. Because the moment we cross over to the other side, You're not going to like the outcome, I assure you. These churches who have compromised the truth wonder why they're losing their young people. Boy, I wonder. I wonder why your young people are running to the world. It's because you're throwing them to the world. Make sure that you are always on the right side. That is, God's side. And we determine that by the word of God. <clears throat> and Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, you sought for David in times past to be king over you. Now then do it. Now Abner's turning. He's realizing, man, this Ishbosheth, and I'm not going to go into the whole story, but Ishbosheth basically just put a bad taste in his mouth. And he realized, this little punk, David's the rightful king. What am I doing following this punk? This this Ishbosheth guy. This this guy's clearly not a man of God. David. David is the man of God. David is is God's appointed. So Abner is now realizing I need to I'm I'm on the wrong side. I need to go to David's side. So he's he's reaching out to the elders of Israel and and communicating with them saying, "You know what? It's time it's time to make David your king. He's the rightful king. We all know it. We knew it years ago. Everyone knows a story about how Samuel found him. Everyone knows that Saul was a crazy guy. Lost his mind. Killed the whole city of priests. We all know that was wrong when he did that. David's the rightful king. So Abner is starting to realize this. Speaking to the, uh, the elders of Israel. <clears throat> Abner said unto David, Verse 21, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel unto my Lord the king that they, make, that they may make a league with thee and that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. And David sent Abner away and he went in peace. So Abner now has basically abdicated from Ishbosheth and told David, uh, gave him his allegiance and loyalties and said, listen, I'm, I will speak to the people and gather the people unto thee, David. I'll make sure that the people are on board, which I already know they are, and you will be king over all of us. Abner finally made it right with David, did the right thing because Abner's a good guy. Abner was a good person. He realized his mistake. Last point, number four. Good people are drawn to good, pe good people. Good people are drawn to good people. You see, because Abner was a good person. Now, I understand, for all have sinned, come short of the ground. That's not what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Abner was a man of integrity. And because of that, he knew that David was a man of integrity. And he knew that Ishbosheth was not. Abner knew. He's like, what am I doing? This little punk. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. I cannot serve this punk. I have too much integrity for that. I want to serve a man of integrity, a man of God like David. And so eventually even Abner was drawn to David because good people are drawn to good people. Now, unfortunately, bad people are also drawn to good people because good people are attractive, right? Who, who, who wants a bad boss, right? Nobody. Everyone wants a good boss. Everyone wants the, the, the man of integrity, whether you're good or bad, every, the good and the bad both want the good guy to be in charge, right? <clears throat> but good people are drawn to good people. I remember uh, <clears throat> I was on a, um, a, an enrollment, a sales enrollment, 
and uh, I was a, uh, helping out this broker, and it was it was his account, and so I was I was assisting him, and and I was as I was speaking with the clients, uh, you know, that I. I Built very good rapport with all the clients, and and uh, you know I, I did very well in numbers, and uh, the broker was kind of listening in because the first time we had met, uh, you know, and he was listening in, and and uh, later after I talked to a, a number of, of clients, he came up to me and he'd been this guy's way older than me, uh, maybe not way older, but uh, he told me what year he started. And I was like, well, I was in grade school, <laughs> you know, so he'd been doing this a long, long time. And a uh, very experienced guy, you know, and, and very good at what he does. He's a very successful broker. And uh, he uh, came up to me afterward and he said, and he complimented me. He said a, very, a lot of very nice things. He said, man, you're, you do a really good job, you know, speaking to people. You make them, you make them feel comfortable and, and, and make them feel at ease, you know. And, and um, man, you're, you're definitely good at what you do. I, I want you, I want to use you again for the future. You know, I'd, I'd love for you to, to help me out again. You know, in, in, in the future, uh, some of my other accounts. And he he said the words these words which I'll never forget. He said, uh, you know, I because I, I, I you know I reckon I've been doing this a long time. You know, real recognizes real is what he said. Real recognizes real. You know, <clears throat> and you know it's true. Real recognizes real. Genuine recognizes genuine. Good recognizes good. Honest recognizes honest. Integrity recognizes integrity. Good people are drawn to good people. You know, as long as you keep yourself full of integrity and honesty and, and, and real, genuine, and the word of God, you will draw like-minded people to you. That's just how it works. You know, it's, it's, it's how it works. I, I've, I've talked to people before complaining about, oh man, I, I just, I, you know, I can't, can't find the right girl or I can't find the right guy. I just, oh man, they're, well, and, I, and I've counseled students about this too. What kind of person are you? Because if you expect this and this and this and this to be your partner, are you yourself this and this and this and this? You know, you want to find a faithful partner. Are you a faithful person? You want to find an honest partner. Are you an honest person? You know, you want, a, you, you want a, a partner who, who loves the Lord so that they can be a person of integrity. Well, do you love the Lord? Are you a person of integrity? You want your partner that, that, that wants to go to church. Do you want to go to church? You know, you, you, you want a partner that, that, that reads the Bible. Do you read the Bible? You know, good people are drawn to good people. And, and, and so people, as long as you are the person that God wants you to be, you will draw like-minded people unto you. Just like David was able to draw Abner from the enemy to switch sides. Because good are drawn to good. Let's pray.